Surrex Dominus Vere, Alleluia, Alleluia. Surrex Dominus Vere, Alleluia, Alleluia. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Through the praise of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laude to Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Sean Mitchell. Sean, how you doing, brother? I'm doing well. How are you, Timothy? Doing very well. Jesus is King. Sean Mitchell converted to Catholicism at the age of 19. He went on to graduate from Ave Maria University in Southwest Florida, where he earned a BA in psychology. At Ave Maria, Sean was the founder and president of the Voitiwa Society, the psychology club, which had the express aim of forming its members to become, quote, students of the soul and students of the person. Sean currently works as a project manager and lives in Georgia with his wife, Catherine, and their three children, Rosie, Elijah, and Colby. You can find Sean's writing at thosecatholicmen.com. Follow the link below to his author page. All of his writings are there. So the the topic today is logos and psychology. So we have been discussing Jews and Judaism and some of the history, especially in the early years, but we have touched on the modern period. And in this show, we're going to be talking about the subject of psychology which involves a number of different Jews as well as non-Jews. And we're going to be talking about logos and psychology in contrasting some, in some contributions of Jews have been rather anti-logos. Others have been pr- sort of logocentric. And there's been also non-Jewish uh, contribution. But interestingly enough, uh, one of the founders, the, mo- the modern fathers of psychology, was in fact a Catholic priest, and his name was Franz Brentano. And I want to start, uh, Sean, by just asking you kind of if you can comment at all on Franz Brentano and what is psychology, basically, because it seems to me that um, so Franz Brentano is so he's a Catholic priest. Ripperger discusses him as. Uh, making a good start in psychology, basing it on Aristotle. And it seems to me that psychology is essentially uh, an exploration of the subjective and an understanding, trying to understand what is the subjective. Is that a fair characterization of what psychology is, or can you break down what it is? Yeah, I, I would say that that's uh, that seems to be a fair assessment. My uh, the the chair of the department there at Ave Maria, uh, Ave Maria University, uh, whose son I'm actually uh, quite good friends with. He uh, was was in mine and my wife's wedding. Anyways, that's besides the point. Uh, he always pointed out that the uh, the etymology of of the word psychology is uh, really a study of the soul, um, and I think that that would um, entail delving into kind of the internal operations of the mind and, and so forth. So the study of, of the subjective. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, that's a, that's a fair assessment. Okay. So the study of the subjective. So there are two different Jews, in fact, that are students of Brentano. And one of the Jews is Edmund Husserl, who goes on to, he gets baptized actually, and he founds phenomenology. And that's a whole nother topic. We're not going to get into that. But it's sort of a philosophical system, which is sort of exploring the subjective to try to boil that down. But the, his other student is Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud, I don't know if you would, Sean, would you say Sigmund Freud is probably the most influential psychologist of the 20th century? It, it seems to me. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah. So, yeah. so interestingly, in some of the research that that I did for for this show, um, I I realized that 
um, even some of the psychologists that uh, that I would say have some decent stuff to offer um, are still influenced by Freud uh, pretty pretty significantly. So um, I, I don't I wouldn't make the claim definitively, but I'd certainly say he's uh, very very influential. Okay, so let's break down what uh, can you try to summarize. What are the basic ideas of Freud that have been influential or what is it, what is his basic theory? Yeah. So for, for Sigmund Freud, um, I would say that we, we start with his kind of view of human nature. So uh, what I would say there is it is uh, basically deterministic and um, it's focused heavily on instincts. So in many ways you can think, uh, it's very animalistic. So um, instincts being sex, uh, I'm sorry, being central to his approach, um, he has this concept of the libido, which would be sexual energy. He later encompassed into this uh, what he would call life, stinks, life instincts, um, which would kind of serve the purpose of the survival of the species, if you will, uh, as might be put in uh, Darwinian terms. Um, and then he also later discussed death instincts, which would kind of encompass the aggressive drives um, within us. So I would say he thinks that our, uh, our human nature is basically deterministic and is heavily influenced by instinct. Um, so I'll only go a little bit further to talk about what we all know uh, about kind of the, the structure of personality in, in, in Freud's view. So this would include the id, the ego, and the superego. I would say in my research that the most important of those three to home in on and understand uh, what Freud's thinking is uh, behind it would be the ego. So uh, let's just quickly go through what these are. And then um, I, I think that would, that'll likely cover Freud. So uh, first we have the, the id. So this would be the primary source of uh, mm. psychic energy and the place where kind of the, the instincts reside. And the function of the id would be to uh, essentially to uh, discharge that energy, to find some outlet for it. Um, and then you would have the, the ego, uh, which would be the, it might be referred to as the executive, uh, and that would kind of mediate between the id and then the real world. And so Freud would say that the ego is governed by the reality principle. Um, so it recognizes that we have these instincts that uh, in, let's say, polite society might not, uh, well, are not uh, acceptable to simply act upon. And so the ego serves as a way of, let's say, uh, slyly being able to uh, act upon those instincts in a way that is going to be acceptable or otherwise not uh, get you in any trouble in, uh, in, in society. Now, he then has the superego. This might be referred to as the judicial branch of personality, and you're seeing the, uh, the kind of uh, allusions to the uh, American system of, uh, of government here. But anyways, you would have the, the superego. Now, this would be, uh, like I said, the, the, judicial the judicial branch of personality. Um, and it would account for, I would say, it's essentially Freud's way of saying, and I suppose we could say that this is to his credit, but it's, it's his way of saying uh, the conscience. Although he says that it represents the ideal rather than the real. Um, and it, it represents traditional values handed down from parents and from society and so forth. So I would summarize all that to say, and he, he also, by the way, acknowledges that if you act against the superego, which 
uh, has this, which constitutes this ideal or gives us an idea of the ideal. Um, if you if you go against it, you might feel guilt and inferiority. Whereas if you uh, act with it, you'll feel maybe, as he would put it, pride and, and self-love. Um, now, I would say this. That's well and good that perhaps he has some concept of of conscience, right, and, and the superego. But his theory plainly states that it's the ideal rather than the real. And I would think that uh, the, the issue with Freudianism is it basically says that's not real. And if you can convince people uh, that that's not real and to suppress the, the, the nagging, if you will, of their conscience uh, and that the real purpose is to uh, seek out pleasure and act in accord with the reality, in accord with the quote unquote ego, uh, then, then you've got a, a, a big problem. So I think that the big thing there is that uh, Freud says that the ego, which is just simply a pragmatic uh, element of personality, is really what's in touch with reality. Excellent. Okay. So I, I want to... Um... Could you could you speak about his theory of repression regarding the libido? Can you describe what that is? Sure, sure. So <clears throat> repression, he would say essentially that, uh, as I understand it, that threatening or uh, painful thoughts and feelings are excluded from one's awareness. Um, and so what this might entail as it relates to the, the sexual libido would be that one suppresses their, say, desire for uh, illicit sexual acts because they recognize uh, via the, the ego that those acts uh, are not acceptable in polite society or could uh, lead to their uh, getting themselves in, in some sort of trouble. And so what Fred's, what Freud would say is that they, uh, they repress these instincts and these feelings that, that arise from them. And this ca causes um, a lot of psychic en energy to be stirred up in the unconscious. And what Freud would say is that the goal of psychotherapy, as I understand it, is to make the unconscious conscious. But who's doing that? The, the, it would be the psychoanalyst, right? And if the psychoanalyst is making suggestions that, well, you have these repressed feelings of, uh, of sexuality and, you know, you're simply not going to be able to live without uh, finding an outlet for these in some way. Sure, maybe if that person is having insane thoughts of molestation or something like that, the psychoanalyst isn't going to encourage that. But I still, I think that that idea of repression of sexual energy and the need in the context of reality to discharge that becomes uh, very problematic. Um, and I, I think would lead people uh, at the very least to illicit sexual acts. Right. I, I think that the the, dip, the most difficult thing about it is that it is has the veneer of science. And this is one of the most difficult things about this whole period is is that it is essentially a scientism because it's it's using certain observations, which we can observe. And then it's making a philosophical claim, which is not observable. I wanted to read from uh, this is from Dietrich von Hildebrand on purity, page six. He says this, Sigmund Freud's thesis on which the so-called psychoanalytical method is based, in spite of the valuable psychotherapeutic discoveries that it has produced, embodies a completely erroneous view of the structure of human personality, which betrays the influence of an exploded sensationalism. Its first radical error is that it regards the body and the physiological life as the form of the soul, not the spiritual soul as the form of life and the body. So that's kind of what you're saying in terms of Freud is turning the human person into an animal in that he's, he's just pure instinct. He's just 
just a, a ball of emotion and, and, and these id urges, which are just pounding on him. And then he just needs to release because he's an animal. And it seems to be starting with that very deterministic materialistic viewpoint. It turns man into this animal. So let the animal just go is his idea. Um, I wanted to here. Here's a, Oh, by the way, I, I should suggest viewers to read uh, Ripperger's treatise introduction to the science of mental health by Ripperger, and which is where he attempts to create a, a firm basis for psychology. And he has a section where he discusses Freud, which I think is interesting. And he says that there, he, he, he discusses that, yes, there is sort of an, a subconscious and Thomas acknowledges that there are, there is sort of a, something that's unconscious in terms of natural law inclinations. People have inclinations towards given things. Um, he says this on page 606. Um, each faculty has its proper object insofar as each faculty is ordered towards that object. Human beings are often unaware of the natural law inclination, even though they act on it. This is something unconscious. But here is where Freud and the other and others part company with Thomas. For Freud, these inclinations could not be frustrated without suffering psychological harm and were principally about sex. Whereas for the Thomas, uh, he discusses, you know, the, the desire for the conjugal act in marriage is a natural inclination, but if a particular person does not marry and lives chastely, that does not necessarily constitute a case of repression. And this is really based on Aristotle. So any, any comments on some of those critiques, Sean. Yeah. So, and by the way, I'm trying the video again. If, if it gets choppy, I'll turn it off, but want the best quality for, for your viewers. So um, yeah, I, I would say uh, there, I think that the most troubling thing that I see um, just in uh, Freudian psychology, as well as uh, some of the other psychologists from the 20th century that, that we'll see uh, that we'll likely refer to here is the categorization of sex as a need per se, right? Um, and they basically lump it in with the need for food, with the need for water, et cetera. Um, and at that point, you have people like, I think it's Wilhelm Reich, uh, advocating for adolescent sexuality, right? Um, so I think that that is a, a, a major, major issue. Um, I will say to, to, to play devil's advocate, although, and, and I, I was going to make this point earlier, there is, I suppose, a, a charitable reading of Freud. You're probably not going to get that from me. Um, I will say that Freud has this idea of you can discharge energy that is primary sex, primarily sexual in ways that are not sexual. Um, but I think the ultimate reality is that he has such a flawed anthropology and understanding of the human person and what his theory ultimately suggests, even if intentionally or, you know, maliciously or in goodwill, he uh, tried to clean it up and, and uh, make some nice caveats. It's ultimately obviously uh, uh, a danger for, uh, for people to think that they're driven by these uh, sexual instincts and uh, need to discharge them. Excellent. So you did mention Wilhelm Reich and I want to just touch on him because we're just talking about the, um, the, this false view of, of uh, sexuality. Um, here's, here's Wilhelm Reich. And here's a quote from uh, this is the man who coined the phrase sexual revolution. And I'm going to read from, uh, this is E. Michael Jones, um, Catholic Church and the Cultural Revolution. And this, he, he discusses a lot of the psycho psychology going on. So Reich wrote a book in 33 called The Mass Psychology of Fascism. So v Reich was a German, uh, he was a Jew who was in Germany. He was a communist, but he, he was trying, he, he, he sort of discovered that um, if you just sexually corrupt the Catholic Church, immediately you will destroy their faith. He says this, uh, we do not discuss 
the existence or non-existence of God. We merely eliminate the sexual repressions and dissolve the infantile ties to parents. So he, all he wanted to do was to just promote sexual promiscuity among Catholics, which would then dissolve their faith. And uh, he was very successful, I think. Any uh, comment on Reich? Yeah, I mean, it, um, I think it's, it's interesting that you, you brought up where he, where he speaks about we, we, we don't discuss the existence or the inexistence of, of God because he has this concept of the, and I want to pronounce it wrong, but the orgone, O-R-G-O-N-E, um, and it's actually a biological energy in his mind that he discovered and that he called God. It's actually in some ways just amusing because I mean, uh, if you can't laugh, you, you, you're going to cry. Right. Um, and I, I was reading about this and he uh, allegedly uh, made claims that he had seen the orgone, which he refers to as God uh, through an organoscope, right? This man was, uh, I think, said by the um, FDA who obtained an injunction against uh, interstate shipment of orgone accumulators, uh, which were uh, boxes in which he, as I understand it, he harnessed the energy of the orgone with uh, uh, naked participants inside of these boxes. So it's just sickening. Um, But they had said that he was dealing with uh, they were dealing with a fraud of the first magnitude. Um, what I got from my reading on Wilhelm Reich is, uh, sure, he's a psychoanalyst, you know, by by trade or whatever you want to say, but he it's really not even worth giving him the title psychologist in, in any sense. Um, it seems like simply at bottom, and, you know, I don't want to, I never want to mischaracterize anyone. Right. But I think at bottom, his was simply about the discharge of sexual energy. And it was even there were many detractors within the psychoanalytic school who just said, we, we can't with this guy. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, but but a pivotal figure. This was uh, 1968 in Paris during the sexual revolution of 68. The, the infamous year uh, Himane Vite came out later that year. They were throwing copies of Wilhelm Reich at the police. And this was mm-hmm. Wilhelm Reich is he's this, this central figure. Um, but uh, there's another figure that's uh, lesser known, and that's Ed Bernays. And so Ed Bernays is the the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And uh, he begins to study Freud. Here he is. And so he gets employed as a PR man. He actually sort of coins the term public relations. And the reason he coins the term is because the term propaganda uh, was used by the Germans and people didn't like that word. So he changed the word from propaganda to public relations. And he was employed by the U.S. government during World War I to promote an image of the uh, U.S. involvement in the Great War as a effort to promote democracy and liberate the world from the tyranny of old ways, etc. And he was very successful in his propaganda. And he realized in the 1920s that the these methods of psychoanalysts and uh, propaganda could be used during peacetime. And he began his work as pu- as a public relations uh, figure. So in the 1920s, what's happening is we have the first sexual revolution. Um, the what you have is um, you know half the men are killed in battle, and everybody comes home, and there's two women to every man, and there's a breakdown of the family. The family structure is, is sacrificed. There's an urbanization. Everybody's moving to the city. They're moving out of the out of the rural country. They're losing their culture and their values. There's the the younger youth generation that didn't fight in the war. They've been neglected. Uh, suddenly, they want to just go out and party. And then you have prohibition come down in the United States. So everyone's illegally drinking now. 
and jazz music hits hits the scene. And all of this is mixed with Freud's ideas. So everyone's there. There's a first sexual first sexual revolution, 1920s. It's happening in, in, in Europe. It's happening in America. And in the middle of that is Ed Bernays. And he he starts promoting the idea that we can use these theories of th Freud, uh, which, uh, like, like you said, Sean, I mean, some of these theories are observing real things in terms of, you know, there are instincts, obviously, there are irrational instincts uh, and inclinations as Ripperger's observing. And Ed Bernays says, well, we can make money off of this. And he forms relationships with big business and big business says, hey, how do you how can we sell these products? So one of the products that uh, here's the famous episode is 1929, his Torches of Freedom episode, which is where the at the time you had the, the first so-called first wave feminism, which is where uh, women were working to get the vote. Um, there was uh, the suffragettes and whatnot. And they, but they were also the head of the temperance movement. They were trying to crack down on alcohol because all the men were going out drinking and neglecting their families. So um, tobacco use among women was taboo. Uh, it was not, it was shunned by women. Women didn't smoke. And so they said to Ed Bernays, Hey, how do we get the women to smoke? And Ed Bernays looked at the situation and he said, let's create a, a, this public relations, AKA propaganda episode which is where we'll have on the Easter parade in March of 1929, we'll have a bunch of uh, rich young ladies in an Easter parade as an act of feminism. They'll light up a cigarette. And he told the presses to call it the torches of freedom. And so you had this event at the Easter parade in 1929, where you had these torches of freedom, which are just cigarettes, and suddenly, this was all of the presses, and suddenly all the women started smoking. And he had put his finger on some kind of psychological uh, motivation that was going on in women at that time, which was essentially a desire for power, a desire for independence. A desire, really, at root, feminism is, is really a desire for human dignity because fem, uh, the women had been oppressed by the Protestant regimes for centuries, so they're trying to reacting off of that. But they are, in order to achieve this dignity, they're looking for power. And so Ed Bernays says, hey, light up a cigarette and you'll get freedom and power. And this propaganda was a massive success. And so the rest is history. Ed Bernays becomes a millionaire uh, just using propaganda, both politically, he's employed by governments and he's employed by big business to simply whip up whatever irrational uh, feeling that the herd is feeling and get them to buy a product or get them to vote or support a war or whatever. And so this is the um, political, economic, and uh, moral effect of this uh, applying Freud's theories through his nephew, Ed Bernays. So a very important figure. Um, he wrote books called things like Engineered Consent. Uh, I think the title says it all there. Um, any comments on Bernays? Sean. Yeah, uh, sorry, gave out a little bit there, but I, I, I heard what, what you were saying. So, um, yeah, Ed Bernays is, uh, is an interesting figure. I, I, I didn't get to do as much research as, as I would have liked to on him. And it, I, I would be interested to delve a little bit more into um, kind of how Freudianism specifically uh, influenced his thinking. Uh, the little bit that I read, which I found to be interesting, is that he actually found the libidinal instincts to be uh, quite dangerous for society. And so one of his aims was to essentially be able to, uh, I guess, manipulate the public so as to uh, help them to redirect these instincts and not to uh, act upon them in ways that actually would result in danger, which, I mean, if that's your, uh, if that's your way of seeing things and that's your aim, well, that's all well and good. But as you read through more of it, you see, uh, essentially, he seems to have been a 
a master in the art of lying. Um, and, and you're very right. He, he dealt with uh, many uh, significant uh, you know, corporations. Uh, he, he dealt specifically and directly with Henry Ford. He uh, dealt with the American Tobacco Company. Um, it's listed that at least four U.S. presidents and, uh, and one first lady. Um, so he was with, with the big wigs. Um, and even toward the end of his life, which, by the way, one thing we didn't mention, he lived to be 103. So just think of how massive his influence was uh, being born in uh, November of 1891 and dying in March of 1995. I mean, he was alive and kicking for a long time because um, at, at what I had read is that he, uh, until the, uh, essentially until the day he died, was having consultative sessions uh, for, you know, PR relations, charging up to a thousand dollars. I think it was per session. So, yeah, I mean, it it would be interesting to delve a little bit more um, into how how Freudianism uh, affected his thinking, but seems to me to have been a uh, a dangerous uh, thinker. I was reading through a list of his uh, quote unquote accomplishments, uh, and I, I won't name all of them, uh, but one of them that I, I found to be uh, particularly troubling uh, is that he allegedly convinced uh, Americans who were concerned about consuming too much alcohol that beer was the quote beverage of moderation. So, uh, yeah, definitely a, a troubling figure. Uh, his connections to uh, psychology. Um, I I wish I knew a little bit more about, but uh, he certainly bragged about Sigmund Freud being his, his uncle. Um, That was uh, a, one thing that I read was uh, known to all who who knew him. Yeah. So, I mean, he's really the, he's the one who really created the, so much of the world that we live in, I think, because his theories, I mean, this is the 1920s. This is back. This is when they discovered how effective, I mean, people have always been using propaganda since uh, Caesar Augustus, but they've never had the technology and the technique that they now have. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This is, this is, uh, you know, anybody who looks into this, it's all right there. Um, so yeah, Ed Bernays. So we, we've touched on also Reich, any other, um, pre-World War II thinkers, do you want to, I think, was Abraham Maslow before? I don't recall, but any, you want to touch on anybody else before we get to um, Victor Frankl? Yeah, so I, I not pre-World World War I. I mean, uh, Maslow would have been uh, born prior to uh, World War I, uh, but his, you know, his influence would have been later. But I, I do want to, I do want to touch on Maslow. He, uh, in my research of him, and and he's one of the ones who I was really able to delve more significantly into. I list, I listened uh, in full to his, uh, to an audiobook of his uh, called A Theory of, of Human Motivation. And I have to say, I was actually surprised because he falls within the, the humanist school of psychology or what might now be called the uh, person-centered school. Um, and interestingly, though, he, he credited Freud in a way with giving us the, uh, a half of psychology. Now, that doesn't mean that he subscribed to everything that Freud thought about that half. But what he meant by that is kind of the, the dark side. Um, and then he said that uh, his job was to provide the other half, which would be the, uh, the more... I guess, humane side um, and the kind of human potential. So in connection with the the human potential movement, right? Um, But Maslow, I actually found to be, and maybe it's just I wasn't listening, you know, well enough, but I I found him to be pretty perceptive. Um, I I was reading, I, I was listening through his theory of human motivation and the way that he describes human needs. Um, everyone knows of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but he says that human, er, the basic needs or human needs are arranged in a, as he calls it, a hierarchy of prepotency. Um, and what he means by that is essentially, so let's, so uh, uh, if I'm getting this right, the, the, the hierarchy of needs starts at the bottom with the physiological needs, food, water, etc. 
it goes from there up to uh, the, the safety needs, shelter, so on and so forth, protection from danger. Uh, from there, it goes to the love and esteem needs, and then finally to self-actualization. Well, what Maslow essentially said is that um, to, now I don't like this phrasing of it, but he said, it is quite true that man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. And so uh, what, what I think he meant to say by that is essentially that uh, when the human being does not have their uh, essential needs being met, it almost becomes their primary focus. Now, we know that the, the, the grace of God um, and, uh, and his assistance uh, helps us to overcome uh, our, our baser instincts and um, you know, our desire to do evil for, for some you know, uh, uh, bodily gain. Um, but we also know that, uh, you know, as, as, as Viktor Frankl said, man is both uh, uh, the kind of being who puts uh, Jews in the uh, gas chambers and also the kind of being who walked upright into those gas chambers with uh, the Shema Yisrael or the Lord's Prayer on his lips. So uh, anyways, I, I think that's actually a, a, a relatively insight, uh, uh, insightful point that um, if you do not have your basic needs met, um, they do become dominating. And, and I think you've mentioned on your show before, Timothy, that, um, you know, uh, I think you said Aquinas would have said that, I mean, what's the use in, in, uh, in preaching the gospel to a man who has no food? You have to feed him first. Right? Yeah, I was just, I was just going to, sorry to cut in here, but yeah, I was about to actually quote that. That's from Summa Theologica uh, Secunda Secunda, question 32, article five, where he says, quote, a, a man in hunger is to be fed rather than instructed, end quote. So the, yeah. that's exactly what you're saying. Just in terms of there is a certain hierarchy of needs in terms of a man that's starving. You have to be feeding him at that point, even though the spiritual works of mercy are higher objectively, subjectively, this particular man may need to be fed first. Yes. And, and I, and I would say, you know, to, to, to wrap up Maslow, I would say that, uh, I don't like that. And I don't know if this is actually what he would have uh, would have claimed, but I don't like seeing, again, sex as one of those physiological needs. Um, it is a uh, there's a physiological drive for it, of course. Um, but I would say that I, I think he's relatively insightful listening to his audiobook, it was worlds more philosophical and, and, and precisely philosophical than I would have thought. And I think even his you know, we, we hear, you know, from the, from the math, Matthew Kelly's of the Catholic world that, um, you know, to, to be the best version of yourself, that's kind of self-actualization, right? But it was interesting because even there, I think if, we, if we're going to say we want to, you know, perhaps see how we can reconcile the, the teachings of, I mean, Maslow is not one of them, but let's say, uh, as a figure of speech, the, the, the noble pagan, or in this case, the maybe somewhat noble Jew, right? Uh, I think with his understanding of self-actualization being at the 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 uh, the highest point of this uh, the the top of this hierarchy, I think you could also almost reconcile it with a sense of calling, uh, because he talked about how uh, the the musician is meant to play music, um, and 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 other things of of that nature. So. I think his theory uh, can't be overlooked in the name of uh, just dismissing it as, uh, you know, being humanism, because uh, oftentimes humanism is, is not good. Uh, and certainly there have been uh, bad effects from it. But I think at least as it comes to this hierarchy of needs, it, it, it has some uh, decent insight. Yeah, it's essentially um, this is what Dietrich von Hildebrand and also Carol Wojtyla did with Edmund Husserl, who was a Jew turned Lutheran. Um, they essentially saw some insights, some logos, and they took the logos and then they uh, purified of any defects. And this is what they did with Aristotle and with Plato. They purified it of any defects. They took the logos that was present and they applied it to something. Yeah, there's certainly problems that can arise um, in which we'll get in. We'll, we'll talk about the 
I, I think I want to get to Frankel and then we could talk about human potential movement because that's gets into this, but in terms of the self actualization and the esteem, self-esteem that can become problematic if it's in this sort of materialistic humanistic uh, context, which denies the supernatural and all these things. Um, but I think wondering if, do you want to do Frankel and then talk about, um, let's see, we've got Eric Erickson, but uh, we could start with Frankel. If you, you want to touch on Frankel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what, uh, Eric Erickson, I think it's really just a point in, in contrasting his developmental stages to that of Freud. We don't even have to explain what they are. I think the names say it all. So if you want me quickly to run through that, that's, that's pretty yeah, quick. Sure, yeah. And then we can move to, to Frankel. So um, you, you've, you've got Freud and he's got these various uh, developmental stages. Um, and what, what Erickson has is kind of corresponding developmental stages um, where he basically says that there is uh, either a, uh, a, he actually uses the word virtue uh, that can develop or a, he wouldn't have called it vice, but uh, something opposite to that virtue that can develop in these stages. So with Freud in the first year of life, you have the oral stage, whereas with Erickson, you have uh, trust versus mistrust. I think that's true enough. Um, if, if a child who, now I, by the way, I'll, 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 uh, I'll preface this by saying I'm not a developmental psychologist. I don't have knowledge of, of, uh, you know, clinical studies in this area, but intuitively it would seem that, yeah, you, you want to attend to your, to your infant when he or she cries, right? Uh, ages one through three, Freud would call this the anal stage. Uh, whereas Erickson would call this, uh, he would speak of this stage as, um, a place to develop either uh, aut autonomy versus uh, shame and doubt. I think that is the age at which we start to see uh, our children developing uh, a, a, a capacity for kind of autonomy and, and, and self-directedness. Uh, preschool age, ages three to six, Freud, phallic stage. Uh, so obviously you're seeing Freud, it's just, it's gross, right? He's just got yeah. these, uh, these, these sexual stages. But you move to Erickson and you see the preschool age uh, would be initiative versus guilt. Um, so we don't have to go into all of those. But I, I think the point is to say that Erickson uh, was uh, influenced by Freud. Uh, I, I think even to, to some extent stood in the psychoanalytic school. Um, but he, he had some, some good to offer, in my view, uh, to speak of these kind of virtues that can develop at each stage of development. And I'll also add here, uh, just as a side note, and, you know, uh, some people might think it's silly, even if you're, you're, you're a, a devout and committed Catholic, but uh, at Ave Maria University uh, in our uh, development class, what we actually did is we, uh, we did a little uh, project on uh, taking these developmental stages and saying, Okay, if we uh, if our children uh, receives the Eucharist at ages six through twelve, where uh, you have uh, identity versus inferiority, uh, how could the could the sacrament um, received then uh, bring about that virtue, and how could it bring about a confirmation? Uh, you know, where there's identity versus role confusion, or uh, when you're married. Uh, intimacy versus isolation. So we kind of took the sacraments and the period at which they happen in one's life and said, how could this help to develop that virtue that Eric Erickson is positing? So I thought that was just an interesting experiment. I really liked it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's essentially what I would say about uh, Erickson. Yeah, I think that that's, there's a great deal of logos, I think, in this model, because it seems to just be observing in a much more rational way, some of the aspects of these different uh childhood periods um and you it seems to me that you can see the truth in some of these aspects in terms of um identity especially you know 13 year olds to 20 for uh, 20 year one year olds identity versus confusion and uh i think identity versus confusion really speaks to the the sort of the freudian um aspect that we're dealing with now in terms of uh transgenderism and uh gay and lesbianism and all you know people who are 
having some kind of confusion and then they're sort of putting their identity in that and then they're latching onto that as as a part of their being and uh it's a, a very deep sort of psychological process that they go through um which needs to be treated with enough um charity and and compassion to be able to win them over to christ and to and to the sacraments um so i think um you know with freud you know just sexualizing everything it really turns that way i guess um but uh any uh let's see frankel frankel seems to be has always struck me as as one of the most logocentric of the psychologists because he has a thing called logotherapy. But tell us about Frankel. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Frankel, uh, and I just start by saying, so I, I, I wrote my thesis at Alvin Ria uh, on, on Frankel. And uh, the thesis has an odd and uh, I guess boring sounding name. It was a human motivation in the context of God's divine plan of salvation. Um, and uh, Anyways, so I, I, I've, I've done a, a good bit of research on Frankel, and, and I think I have a decently under, uh, solid understanding of his thought. So uh, with Frankel, I, I think the first thing that we'd say is that um, his theory, and this might at first sound bad, but is, uh, as he would have put it, essentially concrete and subjective. Now, does that, that does not necessarily mean he delves or he falls completely into subjectivism or into relativism. But his idea is, uh, and this is very present in kind of the, the uh, philosophical writings, even of Carl Wojtyla in, uh, in uh, motivation theory, uh, but he, he posits that uh, reality presents itself to us, um, and we have the duty to respond. And he talks about how the man who lives concretely and subjectively, as he puts it, has this instinctive sureness in sensing his tasks. He seems to me to just be a man who had common sense, had a very uh, uh, real uh, intuition about the natural law and, uh, and had the strength to live it out. Um, so I would say that about Frankel. Um, he also has, you know, we could talk all day about what a, a real solid anthropology is, uh, but he talks about a man as, as he puts it, as a, as a layered structure. Uh, so you would have uh, the, the body, the psyche, and the spirit. So he does have this concept of a, of a spiritual soul. Um, and, and he even talks about um, how, for example, in love between a man and a woman or uh, between parents and children. Um, love has its greatest value in, as he would put it, fixing itself on the spiritual core of the beloved. Um, so, and, and in having knowledge of, uh, of that spiritual core of another, kind of comprehending that person. And I think uh, you and I both as married men could say that uh, we benefit greatly from our wives' uh, knowledge of ourselves even more than we know ourselves. Uh, so I found that to be uh, really beautiful. Um, and he, yeah, so Frankel has has a lot uh, that's good to offer. And I would never want to denigrate uh, any of the, the great things that Frankel um, posits. I would say that there, there is an issue in his thinking. And uh, in my thesis, I touched on it and kind of added the corrective for it in the works of, uh, of John Paul II or, or Carl, Carl Wojtyla. So the issue is that Frankel speaks of, well, first of all, he talks about how uh, there, there may be, and I think he would posit that there is, an ultimate meaning, but he would talk, he would speak of this as a super meaning and the implication being, and he essentially states this explicitly, that it cannot be known 
or to maybe take a a a, a, a lighter interpret interpretation on that that it can't be comprehended um and he and he says that really there's no use in man speculating on the ultimate meaning of life um he said it's not so much that man is to question as it is that man is questioned by reality itself, by life itself, and called to respond. Um, and he talks about, though, how man has, uh, he has this doctrine of existential frustration. So existential frustration uh, pertains, it, there, there are different kind of modes of existence he talks about. So just existence per se, uh, so kind of, I guess, being ontology. Um, but then he, he, he also talks about, you know, ultimate existence or ultimate meaning. And his doctrine of existential frustration would posit that um, by not knowing uh, the, the, the meaning of existence, man is... Uh, Man experiences frustration, and but he just encourages them nonetheless to uh, focus on the concrete and the subjective, subjective to see the meaning behind each concrete act in our lives, to see the meaning behind each case of unavoidable suffering, and how it can mature you, and how it can uh, grow you, and let's say self actualize you, um, to find the meaning behind the toil that you do in your work on a, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so he encourages that very concrete and subjective way. But the problem that I see in that theory is, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm stating all these problems about Frankel, but that's just because I've done so much research. He's worlds better than, than the others, right? Uh, that most of the others that we spoke about. Uh, but the problem that I see with that is that uh, those concrete, the concrete and the subjective those things in which, as he would put it, reality is presented to us and its meaning is still connected to that super meaning. And so man is still going to question uh, and, and be uh, compelled to eventually question that ultimate meaning where he would end up frustrated nonetheless. And so because of uh, the, the, the meaning expressed in those concrete actions being connected to, as Frank would put it, that, that super meaning. It's all, it's all one and the same, but that super, that ultimate meaning is just not knowable. So uh, what I, uh, perhaps we can finish with this, it delves a little bit away from psychology, but what I posit is that um, what Frankel was missing was the salvific meaning behind these concrete and subjective actions. So for example, the salvific meaning behind our work by uniting, as, as John Paul II said, and I think it was Labyrinth Excursions, he says uh, that uh, all work, whether manual or intellectual uh, is linked with toil. And to uh, unite ourselves to the sufferings of Christ is uh, to participate in the playing out of our salvation. Um, in marriage, as, as, as John Paul II would have put it, the, the dignity of every man is assigned as the task to every woman, and the dignity of every woman is assigned as the task to every man. And, to, and, and in marriage, you're in an indissoluble union, and uh, in a way, I think we can say that Christ has united himself to us indissolubly. We can, uh, neither life nor death can separate us from the love of Christ, and so drawing strength from that uh, that indissoluble union between our souls and 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 uh, and Christ, um, we can live out the uh, sacrament of matrimony and its duties effectively. So I think that Frankel had a lot of good to say, and I think I, if I had to say some of the reason as to why his theory is off, it's that it, in some ways it's because he just seems to have been a man of goodwill who just so uh, grasped kind of again, the natural law and the meaning, the real meaning behind um, these, our everyday actions. Um, but he struggled and, and uh, never could really, it seems in his writings that he was, uh, uh, he's not an agnostic as to believing uh, in God, but although a Jew, 
uh, perhaps agnostic when it came to religion, not really sure where he stood in, in the end or that he could make that judgment. Yeah, it seems to, uh, from what I can tell from him, he goes to the concentration camp. He's in the Nazi camp and he's a psychotherapist. He was already a psychotherapist before the Nazis. And he starts to apply psychotherapy to observing the inmates and he's doing sessions with inmates. And he seems to really apply logos to the situation to at least come up with this the fundamental truth of man's search for meaning that man does need logos. He needs a meaning. He needs a purpose in his life because he observed that those prisoners who had faith or had some kind of uh, meaning to their life were able to suffer and endure the, the suffering of the, of the camp. And I think that it does speak. Uh, I, I mean, a great truth that, he, f- he could figure out, which I think can lead others to the full truth because they can recognize that that me- having meaning is necessary. But if the meaning is not knowable or if it's not real, then it's not really a true meaning. And so it's uh, but it seems to be uh, it seems to really take the step towards God and towards that ultimate meaning that is necessary. Yeah, and I, I would I would add also, you know, I think it's in some ways. I, I saw something recently that's it's funny in itself, but it's also uh, uh, probably borders on well, definitely borders on Gnosticism. But it said, um, "Good epistemology covers a multitude of sins," um, and it was funny because I I, I read that and I and, I, and I, I thought about it in reference to this. It's that uh, the the uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church distinguishes between uh, kind of two orders of knowledge. And one of those being the order of revelation. And faith is genuinely a type of knowledge. So that super meaning that Frankel is is referring to uh, can be known by faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And so there really is a, uh, it, it can be posited that faith is a type of knowledge. Um, and, and I think uh, one thing that... I think that Catholics need to recognize is that uh, we will take everything we can from modern psychology that's good, but we can't sneer at um, as people without faith would do um, the, the intertwining of the disciplines of say theology and philosophy and psychology and all these others, because we need a full view of, of the human person. Um, And, and there's one other thing that I wanted to say uh, because I think it points to exactly why you and I are having this conversation um, and also gives, uh, you know, honor to uh, my, my professor who, who, who taught me so well, Dr. Hood. Uh, he, he talked about how, uh, so by the way, he worked for, for 25 years in the, in the VA with uh, veterans. Um, and then he came to teach at Ave Maria uh, wrote a 600 page doctorate at Steubenville. I mean, just brilliant guy. Um, but he said that at every session, he would be, you know, sitting behind his desk, talking to his client and they wouldn't know, but on his, on his computer screen, it said, behold the image. And he said that he had that there because that's what it's about. It's about the image of God in that person. That's why we're seeking to care for that person and to, uh, and, and to bring healing uh, through means of psychology. And then, you know, the, the church has the responsibility through the means of the sacraments and the preaching of the gospel and so forth to bring uh, healing at a, at a uh, more profoundly spiritual level. Excellent. Well, Sean, thank you so much. I want to end by just asking you, um, we've, we touched on just sort of the, kind the, all the thoughts, good or bad of various, um, I guess we didn't touch on Carl Rogers or Kinsey, both non-Jews, um, but they very much continue the Freudian sort of, um, especially Kinsey is very pseudoscience. Um, but, uh, we've touched on a, a number of thinkers. What, uh, books would you recommend for a, uh, orthodox understanding of, of psychology? 
for an orthodox understanding that's that's interesting so i actually haven't i haven't read a ton of you know catholic psychology uh having studied it and uh moved to uh, uh to attempt to get my master's and then had to sidetrack that because kids on the way um i i haven't studied a ton of psychology since then um i think the the bit that i've read of uh ripperger's uh, introduction to the science of mental health is obviously um i think uh uh, first go to, although it is huge, uh, and you know is is going to take. Um, I mean, it's 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 a lot to read through. Um, yeah, that's uh, honestly. I wish I could say that that I know more. There is one, and let me see if it's if I can find it up on my uh, bookshelf here. Um, so uh, you know, I'm not going to say that this is uh, necessarily the. Uh, would bring us to orthodoxy, but uh, I've heard that it's decent. It's by a more uh, a charismatic figure, uh, but it would be uh, Be Healed, uh, A Guide to Encountering the Powerful Love of Jesus in Your Life. And uh, I, it's it sounds like it would be only spiritual, but I I, I, uh, I believe it has, uh, it integrates a lot of psychology into it. So fortunately, I wish I could say more, but that's probably the best I can offer. Okay. Well, I, I have, I put two of my own articles below, which tries to break down some of what Ripperger says. I mean, this really is, this should be the textbook of anybody who wants to be a psychologist or uh, really delve deep into psychology, because it, it really kind of does what we've tried to do a little bit here is to, to interact with the psychological uh, profession and the different thinkers. And what he does is he takes them all, not all of them, but I mean, he, he, he does a great job at looking at Freud and looking at Jung, uh, other thinkers, and then having a Thomistic analysis, which is what St. Thomas did in the Summa. He talks about Maimonides. He talks about Averroes. He talks about all these thinkers of his day, and he's discussing things with them, and he's disputing with them, and he's getting to the root of the truth. So Ripperger, I think, has made a great contribution to psychology by writing this book, which he he intended to sort of ground psychology in a Thomistic, realistic philosophy. And when that is in place, then there are certain things that we can draw from these different thinkers and purify any chaff that is present among them. So I think this is this text is is absolutely fundamental. Um, if you want to go into further sort of the history, I think this, this book by E. Michael Jones is a really great text. So many of his works are tomes. So this one's great because it's 140 pages. Um, but this one really just talks about um, the detrimental effects of this is psychology used as sort of the pseudoscience, which was, became very popular in the human potential movement in the 1960s, which literally emptied out convents. And, and just destroyed the priesthood. And it had a very terrible effect. And it's very important that we face up to some of that because it's still today, uh, this type of thing is still going on today where there's a, there's a very sort of therapeutic Freudian sort of approach to dealing with certain things in the church still today. And there's this lack of this Thomistic uh, spiritual wisdom that's been passed down from our father. So um, those are two text that I, I recommend. Um, so Sean, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, some of your research on this. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, let's offer up our father for uh, oh, Timothy, can I, can oh, I yeah, just go ahead. add uh, I would add one more book and I don't know if I uh, have it up here. It's not uh, it, it's not psychology directly, but you mentioned uh Von Hildebrand uh, a lot of times, and I, and I know you admire him as a thinker. He has a book called The, the Heart. Now, people, you know, say that Von Hildebrand, uh, you know, being a phenomenologist and particularly his view on uh, happiness is, uh, as, a, as opposed to Aquinas' view is problematic. But in the end, I think he explores deeply into the subjective being a phenomenologist, and I think borders on uh, kind of doing philosophical psychology and particularly on the emotions. And this is probably the, probably the problem that we see in humanism is uh, an emphasis on, uh, you know, the following of the heart over and against all things. Uh, Von Hildebrand speaks of how 
uh, the affections, um, they correspond to some object. And that in that sense, they have uh, some rationality. Um, but we need to be able to assess when we're having experiences of emotions, uh, why those are, um, and also to recognize that, for example, if in prayer we have uh, a, an experience that, uh, that includes emotion, that is because, as von Hildebrand would put it, there is a, there is a value response, um, and it's, it's a response to something outside of ourselves, namely God, meant to draw us out of ourselves to worship of him. So anyways, I think von Hildebrand just has a lot of good kind of correctives to perhaps the humanist school and just as a great figure, although not a psychologist directly. Yes, I, I definitely always recommend von Hildebrand. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, one of my favorites. So, all right, well, what, we're going to wrap up. We'll offer up in our father. Uh, I want to especially offer up in our father for those who have uh, different difficulties with psychological wounds or emotional wounds or things that they're dealing with that they go to psychologists for. And we want to pray, especially for them to uh, find the, the spiritual healing that is necessary to uh, truly grow in virtue and overcome the difficulties that we face uh, in the family and uh, in our spiritual life. So let's offer up in our father uh, with all of our uh, works uh, through the merits of the mother of God, that they may be acceptable to overcome the virtue or overcome the vices we, we are faced with and acquire the virtues to the glory of God. In the name of the father, the son, the Holy spirit. Amen. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.